Nay Mohammed combines films, photography, drawings, and essays to explore forms of utopia and dystopia in South Asia after 1945. He has exhibited and lectured in India at the Sarai CSDS, Tiranada Museum of Art, School of Environment and Architecture, at Studio Camp Bombay, Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute in Kolkata, at the Kochi Miseris Biennale, etc. He is represented by the Experimental Gallery. Midnight's Third Child, published by Nokta Arts in association with ULAP Press, is an anthology of essays on the artists and movements from Bangladesh. And I have my copy of the book here with me. Uh, it's an wonderfully marked here. Um, the, uh, the title is a translation of a Bangla phrase, which I will not butcher, but which roughly translates to the goat's third child jumps more. The title thus signals this a threefold sign of Bangladesh which existed as East Bengal until 1947, East Pakistan until 1971, and following the liberation war as Bangladesh. Given these movements, reversals and renewals, the idea of Bangladesh itself remains contingent and contested. The anthology thus reflects on the people, projects and conversations that bring in this multiplicity and also challenge majoritarian views. This is evident in the introductions to the anthology written by Naim along with Tanzim Bahab and Zirbat Chaudhary with essays penned by Naim and also featuring conversations with artists and practitioners including Dhali Al Mamoon, Salahuddin Ahmad, Shahidul Alam, Taiba Begum Lipi, Zia Haider Rahman, among others. The essays bring together not only individual practices, but also artist-led spaces and foster that foster practices, such as the Drick Picture Library, Partshala Institute, and festivals such as Joby Mela and magazines like Depart. The anthology thus takes us through these varied spaces of artistic production and mediation as not just an exercise in mapping artistic practices, but as an amalgamation of references preoccupations in the subjective artistic experiences and friendships, a camaraderie and a collective spirit towards direct action. With that, I would now like to invite Naim to speak more, uh, to tell us more about the book and give us a glimpse into the very many strands and connections that you draw upon in your writing and work. Thank you and over to you now, Naim. Thank you, Arundhati, for the um, warm welcome and uh, nice to see the copy of the book in your hands um, with its heavily marked up uh, annotations. I'll say a little bit about the genesis of the book um, and then I'll read an excerpt that I think is relevant to this conversation and I'll ask you to just kind of watch time because when I'm reading excerpts and showing clips, I lose track of it. Um, the genesis also has an irony with already embedded within it, which is, of course, the fact that the book is in English. So the essays came about in a very, very uh, sporadic, non-systematic, um, meandering way. Uh, at the beginning, before starting, Rahab and I were speaking and with you, and Rahab made a reference to my obsession for lists. And that obsession is there, but the lists are fundamentally flawed. And when we were putting the book together, the first thing that Tanzim and I pointed out is that if this was supposed to be a roadmap of Bangladeshi visual cultures, primarily spanning visual projects in the museum and gallery, films in the theater and on television, and novels, and a little bit of journalism in the form of op-ed. But if this was the roadmap, then there are large swaths of it missing. And that's the first thing to say. Uh, there are many, many blind spots. Based on the fact that I'm not a regularly employed art critic or film critic for a newspaper, I was never commissioned by any of the Bangladeshi newspapers to write something which would have a certain rhythm. You would be sent out to write. Uh, my cousin who's passed away, Faiza Hawk, was actually an art critic for the main English newspaper, the Daily Star, and she wrote systematically over 20 years. And many people refer to her work for a certain uh, roadmap in, in a different style of artists of the 1990s and 2000s. 
but I never had that role. So most of the pieces came about because of a certain enthusiasm and sometimes a uh, desire to correct. So some of the pieces were written precisely because I had gone to see an exhibition, for example, Abir Shom, who's in the book. I looked at the audience and I had this instant reaction to Tanzim Wahab, who's been my collaborator and comrade for many years, that nobody's getting this work. That's what we said. And we would look at people taking selfies in front of Abid's work and say, this is not landing properly or it's not landing at all. Um, we would say, people are getting a certain entertainment value, but Abir had done a very particular provocation based on references to the Western canon. Um, Abir Shom, I won't read from the excerpt here, but he always said that uh, doing projects with broken English was his politics, that he wouldn't put Bengali, he would put English, certain kind of subversion. And when you come away from this exhibition and think it didn't land, then I would go and write something. So it's therefore very sporadic. Um, you know, both um, gender and ethnicity are blind spots here. There are far fewer uh, female artists reviewed here, and there are far fewer non Bengali artists, uh, whether Urdu speaking or Adivasi. Uh, those are big gaps. Uh, but we also decided that we wouldn't correct it later because we wanted also to be true to what had been written when these pieces were originally published. So the genesis came about because Tanzim Wahab uh, has been working on a project um, with the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is, um, the exact title eludes me, but it's supposed to be a source book on South Asian art practices. And there's members on that editing committee from India, from Pakistan, uh, and from Bangladesh. I would say Bangladesh is underrepresented as always. Tanzim is the sole member from Bangladesh on the editing committee. India is overrepresented, as it usually happens, and Pakistan is somewhere in the middle. Nepal, um, Nepal, I'm not even sure if it's represented. Sri Lanka also has a rep representation. And representation is not the only uh, metric, and sometimes it's also a flawed metric in the name of representing country, all sorts of, in our Tanzim and I opinion, all sorts of weak um, projects can also enter. Uh, but we did feel that here was a South Asian art representing practice again, which was going to come out in a book form. And it was going to come out in English and it was going to come out uh, from New York. And in 2022, I think, or 2021, um, post-pandemic, Tanzim and I were having this conversation. Tanzim was spending all this time. And I said, look, yet again, this book is going to come out from New York, from MoMA. And it's going to set a conversation on what is South Asian art. And it's going to be in English. You know, we have no control over how we are represented. Uh, we've always had this conversation. And, and so Tanzim said, you know, why don't you collect all that you wrote into a book form? And that's how the project came about. When we collected it, the blind spots immediately appeared that there were vast gaps. But we also made a very practical decision to not add that we wanted it to be representative of what there was. And so we stayed there. And so that's the first context. And anyone picks up the book, uh, I hope they would see a meandering roadmap. They would see that in the introduction, there's a list of artists and curators that I didn't speak about, which was my way of saying, this isn't comprehensive at all. If anything, somebody should pick up this book and then be either enraged or inspired enough to do their own uh, alternative project. I could imagine a book that talks back to this and all its gaps. So that's also part of the idea. So what I'll do is I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from, um, or I'm going to read uh, the entire uh, text from one piece that sets the stage for a certain kind of provocation we were trying to do in the book as well. Uh, but I will say that as I um, read the excerpt and as I talk about this issue, again, the thing that we're critiquing is also in this book, which is that it's in English and therefore still privileges a certain kind of dominance. For now, um, that's the book. Uh, the gap is, of course, that it's not in Bengali. So there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. So I'll read a short excerpt from the introduction first and then I'll read a text from Hegemony, which sets this conversation. A few years back, I protested on social media, a Le Monde review in French of Bangladeshi art. In the midst of an otherwise anodyne article was this assertion. The most interesting Bangladeshi artists are therefore to be found elsewhere, in London, Runa Islam and Rana Begum, or in New York. 
A European newspaper safari-like discovery of Bangladeshi art spaces was accompanied by the idea of the essence of interesting only to be found in the diaspora. Such artists can dangerously pit Bangladeshis against each other, suggesting conflicts and hierarchies between diaspora and local, with loop conversations around authentic and real lurking around the corner. The discussion around this French review ran for a few days on social media, but no one seemed willing to take the step of confronting Le Monde in public although we were not always deferential to the French, as you will see in the essay about Muzi Gimei in this book. There was and is the idea of cultural workers as passive recipients of discussions around their work, a concept that Dhali al Mamun and Tarek Masood did much to dismantle, referred to in the interview that closes this book. For some time in the 1990s, the dyad of India-Pakistan was of interest to a newly emergent discursive art circuit, primarily based in Asia, and especially inside our local hegemon, India. Thus, the discovery of Bangladesh by a global press appears to be an evolution from that earlier dyad into a more diffuse, but still problematic attention economy. These flows intersect with my own research, which is about Bangladesh as the third point in the triangle created by two partitions, India and Pakistan in 1947, and then after 1971, East Pakistan reborn as Bangladesh. There are many luminous and productive conversations that can be held in the subcontinent, spanning not only India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, the triangle again, but also Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and others. And yet, eight years after that Lamond article, discussions about Bangladeshi artists continue to deploy such phrases as first ever. The political problem of this language is that it deploys artists against each other, creating rivalry and competition in a never-ending quest for being the first to land on some uncharted moon. There is a larger structural envelope that worried me already about a decade ago. What this new art discourse is doing is alienating ourselves from our own history by rewriting art movements as sui generis, without antecedents. And to underline the irony, I'm actually going to start with a clip from a film that has nothing to do with Bangladesh. It is thoroughly in the Western canon. 19 years after I first watched it, that scene from Sofia Coppola's Virgin Suicides has stayed with me. The sequence in which a teenager explains her death urges to a bewildered doctor. Obviously, doctor, you've never been a 13-year-old girl. Watching that film during its opening week, I thought instinctively, I know you and then felt a sharp pang of dislocation from myself. Why was I already so familiar with the motifs of American high school suburbia, though my own imprint of that same age is thousands of miles away in 1980s Bangladesh? If these were supposed to be shared stories, the flows were only the legendary romantic couple of Uttam Kumar and Sushitra Sen, who captivated Bangla audiences in the 1960s. By mistaking the vampires and shopping mall sunlit noir of Stephen King novels as my own story, I had lost part of the city and life I grew up in. This sense of familiarity with other stories comes from the manner in which a set of experiences and histories have been normalized as universal. When making a work, wherever you may be from, there is an awareness that certain things can appear as elements in your work without requiring explanation or footnotes. I wondered about this freedom for over explaining when I saw with pleasure that Rux Media Collective had taken Bangla filmmaker Ritik Ghatak's last work, Jukti Tokko Ar Goppo, a reason debate and a story from 1977 as an anchor for their curation of the 2016 Shanghai Biennial. But would the audience take this gesture and Moinak Bishash's installation that spliced together Ghatok across screen under the title Across the Burning Track and Geeta Kapoor's chapter about the film in When Was Modernism as a familiar shared story? Or would it always be embedded in elsewhere? In Hegel, Haiti, and Universal History, 
Susan Buck Morris argues that the Haitian slave rebellion was the template for Hegel's master slave concept. But references to dialectic struggle considered this the solitary invention of the German philosopher. The European and American sense of entitlement and dominance of history pivots on the idea that theirs are the stories that matter. It's a different version of a proposition Deepesh Chakraborty made in provincializing Europe. Europe gets to be theory and non-Europe is always the practice. Proof of principles already established by Europe. The enchantment of this concept can alienate you from your own con context, adrift at home. In high school, I had DJed on Radio Bangladesh's world music program in Dhaka. In a half hour slot, we were required by radio slash government regulations to play at least one Bangla song within the definition of world music. We did this extremely grudgingly. Later, when I read Pop Idols, British Pakistani novelist Kamila Shamsi's contribution to Granta's Pakistan issue, I felt a surge of recognition. In the 1980s and 90s, we had obsessively listened to the same British bands that she referenced from Pakistan. I felt sad too. Why had we been so slow to listen to the songs that were being composed around us in our own city? Nobody forced us to watch all those American films, certainly not in 1985, when VHS players were expensive and rare in Bangladesh. Video cassettes could be found in just two stores in Dhaka, and the police would routinely raid them to seize blue films, and yet we kept at it. By the time it premiered, the detached houses, flare plants, summer soundtrack, and football pitches of the virgin suicides felt as familiar as our own lives. Museums, universities, and other institutions are now targets of critiques about decentering the canon and ending European hegemony in the production of culture and knowledge. Efforts sometimes focus on expanding, hiring non-white curators and academics, collecting works by non-Western artists, etc. These are necessary steps, but I wonder if they will be enough. Increasing the number of non-European protagonists is a way to disturb the status quo. But what to do with the familiarity of certain stories and the strangeness of others that has settled into our bones over generations? A change of gatekeepers alone won't shift this. The English language as a global flow melds with the triumphalism of capital in projecting European and American culture as world culture. Sometimes I mistake myself as part of this we, including now when I'm reading this in English, and then realize it is because of a century's project of soft dominance. The late Mladen Stilinovich understood this with his bitter sarcastic work called An Artist Who Cannot Speak English Is No Artist. I have been thinking about how the museum gets to a place where the majority world is not a therapeutic addition to what is already overrepresented but a shared project. Furthermore, should the same institutions that furthered Eurocentrism now be allowed to do an about face and be the sole saviors as well? This comes back to the Museum of Modern Art source book that Tanzim and I were discussing, even as we participated in it, Tanzim as the editor from Bangladesh and myself as someone one of whose works had been proposed by Tanzim, again, because it was written in English. Should they and we benefit financially and culturally from undoing the problems they and we created in the first place? In Bangla, we would say, agattao khai, gurattao khai. They eat from both the treetop and its roots. The location of these contestations need to be radically shifted. I'm going to pause and play one more clip to underline what I'm speaking of. This is the trailer from My Architect, uh, made by Nathaniel Khan about Louis Khan. The film's finale is at the Shongshod Bhavan Parliament building of Bangladesh. This film, among other things, put that building further onto an architectural roadmap. 
And yet this film and our discovery of this film and our celebration of the film comes through, again, the American architect um, and a Euro-American protagonist who allows us to see our own work, our own building, even though that building was sitting inside Dhaka all this time. Lou was the most beloved architect of our time. All my buildings don't add up to his three or four buildings. Three or four masterpieces more important than 50, 60 buildings. Lou was a breath of fresh air. My first works came out of my reverence for him. I didn't know my father very well. He never married my mother, and he never lived with us. I needed to find out who he really was. So I set out on a journey to see his buildings and to find whatever was left of him out there. Hi, this is Nathaniel Kahn calling. Don't think that he was always trying to be a prince. He did not understand it. Isn't it just two strong egos? It's pure ignorance on Lou's part. Did you ever drink with Lou? <laughs> yeah, you should ask my first wife. Did anybody know that Lou had three families all at once? No. That was part of his mystery. No camera, please. It was never rebuilt. It was just left this way. Yes. I'm the architect's son. He was oh. my father. Is he alive? When I was in Dhaka, the film was over, said Nathaniel. Inside the Shongshut Bhabun, Nathaniel had projected ghost traces of his unclaimed father onto cavernous spaces. Even in the midst of the brutal war of 1971, Louis Kahn continued to work on this project in spite of the protestations of junior Bangladeshi architects working with him. When the war was on, everybody said, stop working because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if there's going to be a government after this, and you're not being paid. Louis Kahn's response supposedly was, when there is peace again, they will need this building. When I first reviewed my architect in 2003, I wrote, not only is it home to Bangladesh's parliament, its central vast green grounds act as an oasis in the middle of a poorly planned, congested, third world mega city. Speaking of its multiple uses, Nathaniel said, everybody has a story about meeting a friend on the plaza, playing a game on the lawn, being a child on the lawn, walking around the Crescent Lake, exploring the area that the streets go past the hostels. But Nathaniel was extraordinarily lucky with the timing of his film. A few years later, and he would have filmed his finale in a lonely fortress, empty of people, life, or energy. It is ironic that the party in opposition always boycotts parliament sessions. His last low angle shot would have taken in a wire fence past the legs of guards, sentries, paramilitary, and police. Security barriers would be everywhere. Guards, guns, security. Security, security, security the trickly, unctuous word spanning the last decade, squeezing life out of everything. There would be no civilians within a single frame of the film finale, certainly not the exuberant Dhaka Morning Walkers Club, one of whom mixes up architect Louis Khan with Louis Farak Khan, the leader of America's Nation of Islam faith group. Since 2006, the building has been dying, fatally surrounded by fences, the cage of national security panic, the only framing device left for Khan. 
In 2008, a group of German architects came to visit Dhaka. Armed with university letters, ministry permissions, and VIP phone calls, they were allowed access to the inside grounds. I called up one member and asked if my friend could join them. She has never been inside, you see. I don't think we can manage that. They have taken photocopies of everyone's passport. But she's Bengali. It seems the officials didn't care. My Bengali friend stayed behind. Later, the German architects met us for dinner. We, who could only imagine the interior, had to depend on these visitors for a second-hand look. Wide-eyed stories of soaring beauty, but also sadness at a crumbling interior, absence of light, eerie stillness, sleeping cleaners, the smell of cat excrement. 2014, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Another group of visitors, this time Western curators in town for an art exhibition. Another tour of Shongshot Bhavon had been arranged. This time, a photographer friend wanted to join. He had never been inside the Shongshot Bhavon in his whole life. How is that possible, I asked. And he replied that there are no tours of the Shongshot Bhavon. Remember, Naeem, he said, you are older. Now that he mentioned it, the tour I received was in the 1980s. I cannot convey that time to you. Thousands of people thronging the Shongshot Bhavon grounds. Those who have not seen it, will not be able to imagine that open-hearted, generous, democratic city could be Dhaka. That was before the new normal. I mentioned my friend's wish to the organizers, and they ruefully told me that copies of passports had to be submitted to the authorities two weeks earlier. Two weeks to receive clearance to visit our own Shongchod. In 2008, it had taken two days. Even that had seemed too much. Is temporality a mechanism for demonstrating we are serious? Has it really come to this? The only way I can enter the Shangshot Bhavon is to come in with Western visitors. The rest of you go home, wanting to take a morning walk, do adda with old friends, eat china badam, hold hands with your partner, take in the fresh air, gaze into the open space, the vision of stone, a beginning of life. Not now. Not here. Your city is dying. Finally. This week came the controversy about the wall being erected that will mar Louis Kahn's original design. What has not already been marred by the apartment complex across the street. No wall on Khan when the slogan yesterday and a group assembled for silent protest on Manikmia Avenue. In my architect, a young boy stares up at the Shongshut Bhabon and is reflected onto the water. He expresses the sense of wonder we drink in at journey's end. Someone has choked the joy out of that scene in the name of security. And now walls will go up, sealing off a cenotaph, killing a living building. The location of these contestations need to be radically shifted. Expecting the global South to always bring its narratives into the Western proscenium places reparative labor on one side and beneficiary flow on another. The imperative becomes for we to know equally our stories and yours, a project of twice the work. What is needed is much more entanglement between the two, not only in listening to these stories, but also in their making, not as duty, but as pleasure the way things could be. So I'll pause there uh, and maybe talk with Orundhuti a little bit. And then if time allows, I might read uh, one more excerpt, which actually talks about the conversation and struggles, dualism between the two Bengals, Bangladesh and West Bengal. Um, I went through two essays that jumped, but made a connection that was not made explicit in the book, but now I'm making that connection, which is between the alienation from self and familiarity with other, and then at the same time, it, dislocation from a building that's supposed to be ours and our ability to see it only through the visiting American architect's son. And maybe the two Bengals is a much larger, different, uh, perpendicular conversation that we can come back to. But Urundhuti, let's get into some of the mess uh, <laughs> of this problem. 
Yes. No, I mean, in fact, what I was thinking uh, on the conversely was that so much of the structure of the book, even as it is set up in the introduction, is very dialogic in nature. And I feel like that's one thing that you proved yourself when you said there was this connection that you made between two disparate pieces that sort of speak to each other in a way, um, the self and the other and the othering of an inanimate um, building in an object in that sense. Right. I um, should add one thing, Arundhati, uh, just to contextualize it within the audience, which I'm not presuming is Bengali speaking, is that I had presented this in Dhaka and had certain clips that I've shown for which the familiarity of the audience with those clips means you don't have to explain them. And the second thing which I realized uh, this morning, my time, when I started um, reviewing those clips, it suddenly can, came into my head that, oh, these are Bengali clips. And even this audience might need English subtitles. So I, I shifted to the Louis Kahn clip because that's in English. And as I prepared it, then I also thought, oh, here we go again. An English language American film is what I need to communicate to an audience that I presume is primarily Indian, may or may not be Bengali speaking. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, perhaps to begin with, just so, to, so that we can familiarize the audience a little bit more with the book itself, I was wondering if you wanted to speak about this sort of dialogic nature and how the structure of the book also came about because there is, of course, uh, essays and writing that you've done in the past, but it's also interspersed with conversations with practitioners. And, it, you know, there's not a strict division. It all sort of flows into one another. So if you wanted to talk a bit about that. Sure. And um, the the split, the three-part split between yeah. uh, uh, the three sections, which use Bengali language names without translation. Uh, actually, there is translation. Sorry. Yeah. Chile Kota by Sentry in the Attic is a, is a book by uh, Akhtar Jaman Elias. Ajar Chobit Deshe or Land of a Thousand Pictures is a phrase I had used. And then Deole Likon is a popular phrase where you say the politicians must pay attention to the Deole Likon. You know, the writing on the wall means what's coming. Um, you know, but that structure I used to divide between, um, broadly speaking, you know, visual arts, uh, film practices, and literary practices. But those, that threefold structure that I've done also doesn't actually. Um, stay. Tariq Masood as a filmmaker was also a writer, you know, he wrote poems, um, as is quite <laughs> common, and some of them were published, some of them were not, or he wrote songs actually with a, a band called Bangla, which um, in the 1990s when Tariq Masood wrote songs with them, it was one of the first of very popular mass circulation musical band that was completely going back to its roots as opposed to when we were growing up all the popular bands were singing English songs or poor translations of English songs so that sort of back and forth was going on between filmmaker and writer of lyrics for musicians first perhaps he did it because he wanted those musicians to appear in his film and then it became an album that um, came out separate from Tariq Masood. So these kinds of spillovers were always happening. One of the things that Tanzim and I have spoken about, um, Tanzim is a graduate of uh, uh, Patshala, the photography school, our um, our very iconic photography school that has trained also many uh, photographers from India, such as Shomo Shankar Bosch and others. Um, you, you know, Tanzim was trained as a photographer, but he works as a curator and he's one of our most vital curators. And he said, well, look, I was trained as a photographer. And I said, do you miss taking photographs? And he said, no, because being a curator is an extension of my photographic practice. And so this is something we've thought about how everyone does a little bit of everything. And you can say it's interdisciplinary, it's uh, polyvalent voices, it, you know, it's um, autodidacts, but it's also the fact that a certain kind of strict division of curators do this and writers do this and filmmakers do this wasn't possible, perhaps because of a deficit as well. Um, I mean, I'm not supposed to be a critic. Um, and it's actually especially a problem for me to write critiques of films, because I might then next make a film and be with, you know, you really shouldn't be a filmmaker reviewing other people's films. And now I don't actually, because now the webs are enmeshed enough that I shouldn't. Um, I mean, not that these pieces are not meant to be, they're not trying to be neutral. Um, they are, of course, partisans in a loving way, but there's a, there's a reason why, for example, criticism is separated out for a certain distance or, and 
uh, embedding within a practice full time. And we haven't had that situation. You know, we've had photographers who had to be curators who curate and then um, write as well. You know, we just had the uh, photography biennial in Germany that was canceled, that was curated by um, three photographers, uh, you know, Shohidul Alon, Tanzim Wahab and Munem Wasif. And, you know, they're all practitioners of the images that they were also curating. So these kinds of moving between and collapsing walls has been born out of necessity. Um, you know, maybe there are more critics and curators now, so some of that necessity has gone away. So I feel like that was in the book, that that sort of um, crossing between, um, you know, if you actually sit down and time out when these pieces were written, there are big gaps. And in those gaps, I wasn't writing something else. I was working on my own films, right? And then I would see something every sort of saying, why isn't, you know, like Mullah Shagor, I, I, I went to his install and I said, why isn't anyone in this room? Or why are people leaving after two, three minutes? Okay, I have to tell people that this is, you know, what this is an homage to. So it came out of that. And so that spilled into the structure. Um, longer academic essays, I haven't written that many, but the long academic essays that I have written, those were deliberately not included. Um, so that's also another thing because we didn't want short pieces to suddenly be accompanied by a piece that goes on for 40 pages. Um, and there was like a sort of anti footnote orientation to this book because we wanted it to be mass popular and without hurdles. Although of course it's in English, so there's already a hurdle, um, uh, you know, automatically within Bangladesh and West Bengal. So yeah, so those were some of the reasons why the book structure came about and there was a point when we were like, oh, we have to add this and we have to add that and I should write. The only new piece actually that was added um, at, after the editing design stage was a new piece I had written about Sharkar Pratik um, and his photography project on the trains and the way that the trains also evoke uh, the time of United Bengal because the train system went throughout Bengal and now they're ruptured. And, you know, I talk about the border crossing by trains, which I've talked about elsewhere as well, about, you know, they're the two Bengals, but they're you know, incredibly difficult to get from one to another. And people like Sabiha Sumar have made the films come um, about these kinds of things for the Punjab situation. But again, Sharkar Pratik, that's another example of a response. He had a photography commission for National Geographic, which once upon a time used to be the place for a photographer to publish. Um, it isn't the same now, right? So, and Pratik got this commission to publish his uh, photographs of the train um, stations and systems, and they wanted a text. And I wrote a really long text that included reference to uh, Suttajit Rai's uh, Pothir Pachali and the scene where the train bifurcates the scene, bifurcates the screen. And it was really long, and National Geographic's response was, you know, this isn't what we need. We need like something factual. And we kind of had a um, uh, struggle, I would say, and, and I can say this because, you know, it's fine. Um, it was a very... Um, hostile interaction in the sense that I sent it and they said, this doesn't work. And I said, I won't change it. And then this went back and forth. And finally, for the sake of Pratik, I said, okay, let's just do what they say. Let's cut it down to 500 words. And he and I were both really um, uh, frustrated by the experience of publishing with National Geographic. So we just kind of went rogue and published the original um, in Dhaka Tribune. Um, so that was also, again, and, you know, Pratik and I were both, like, we, we said, National Geographic isn't National Geographic anymore. You know, we don't, they don't even have the same impact that did. So why are we being so reverential, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the one piece that was added on um, at the end. Yeah. Right. And I mean, I think this also um, brings me to another point that I, that I had come across as I was reading the book, which was in uh, Tanzim's introduction, where he's, Sort of situates the pieces in the book as criticism from outside and inside, moving from writing to direct action, from critique to practice, <clears throat> excuse me, in a sense. And of course, then that brings us to the question of the artist and the, as a cultural worker, a producer, and simultaneously a mediator of art. Um, I know you mentioned that perhaps it could be a result of a necessity, but I also wonder if that brings about a different kind of um, reception even to the works that are produced. And uh, here I might also want to mention your piece on Tariq Masood and uh, Dhali al Mahmood and kind of what they did, um, you know, from the beginning and the interstices between producing work and writing or heading editorial initiatives, for instance. Um, so perhaps if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. 
it's hard to tell if it um, changes the reception because um, a lot of, you know, Tariq Masood died in a um, tragic road accident. So on the cover of the book is, um, you know, uh, Tariq Masood and also, uh, yes, you've got the cover. Thank you. Um, you know, Tariq Masood's head is actually turned. Um, uh, you know, he's on the far left. You can't see his face. So Tariq Masood died in this tragic car accident. And so did Mishuk Munir, his cinematographer, who's on the right side of the thing. Dalyal Mamun is in that picture smoking a cigarette and he survived that same car accident. And a lot of the things, yeah, so it's like quite, um, and then another person, um, Jyoti, who's in that picture, has been missing um, since a certain date. That's all in the book's explanation. So out of the five people in that image, four, three have passed away, one has survived. You know, a lot of things that we talk about with Tarek Masood is also the act of posthumous collection. There's been a lot of compiling of his interviews, you know, um, spare elements that um, uh, gained extra value uh, or even um, iconic value once the person has passed because you know there are no more films, right? And he was working actually, um, Tariq Masood is important to talk about to get into the two Bengals piece that I uh, didn't read from. Uh, you know, his first iconic film that I wrote about that began my engagement with writing about uh, Bangladeshi cinema um, came out in 1996 called Muktir Gan. It was the first documentary on the 1971 war that used actual footage. Um, lengthy, extensive footage in color, images of the war that none of us had ever seen. And again, the footage was shot by Lear Levin, an American advertisement um, and independent filmmaker who had wanted to make a film on the war and hadn't finished. So again, in this situation, the iconic film depends on a uh, Western filmmaker who in this case didn't finish the work. So there's some parallel with Louis Kahn who died without finishing the building. Um, you know, so that was 1971. Um, you know, then he made another film about the war in which for the first time, the figure of the pious Muslim, uh, in fact, the madrasa, was presented in a different way because prior to that, the position of Muslim piety within the war was suspect because Muslim piety was within films always presented as being the reason that you're allied to Pakistan. So if you're a pious Muslim on screen, you are also usually the villain who is going to, you know, rub their hands with invisible soap and, you know, show the Pakistan army where the guerrillas are hiding. Masood in his film, Matir Moina, for the first time broke that, where the madrasa is a site of people who are debating the war. And some of them are saying, well, Pakistan shouldn't break because it's the Muslim homeland. And some other people say, well, do we need a Muslim homeland in that way? And they talked about, you know, the role of violence and conversations. Uh, I remember a phenomenal film, if people haven't seen it, Matir Moina or Claybird, uh, Essential Viewing. And he was working on a third film called Kagodir Fool, um, or paper flower, which was going to be going back to partition. Right? So it was this move of, we can't have our history start in 1971, and we can't erase 1947, which has been a gesture. 47 in some ways gets erased so that 71 becomes the year zero of Bangladeshi subjectivity. Um, and all of Tarek's writing and thinking was collected posthumously. Um, you know, a slight digression, but related, I was just at a reading of Poetry by Edward Said, um, you know, and he's not somebody we associate with poetry and it's unpublished poems that he wrote as a young person that have now been compiled uh, for the first time. It's a book called uh, Songs of an Eastern Humanist. And there's a way that, you know, all of Said's canon, including um, his notes, his interviews, his poetry, all have this extra iconic value you read into even a poem he's written at age 16 or 18 because he isn't here. You know, and Saeed also died, um, passed away relatively young, um, relatively, not as young as Tarek Masood. So, um, sorry, I, I diverge very far from your original question, but maybe I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to come back to it. But this sort of thing of uh, works having an extra value because you collect them together at the end was one of the streamlines in the project. I would personally say that I write a lot less now about contemporary Bangladeshi works. And certainly I have stopped writing about films because now I'm too enmeshed within that world. And, you know, writing about it would even interfere with, um, you know, uh, making work. Uh, there is a way, uh, I, we've had lengthy discussions about this, that sometimes you carry all sorts of influences and thoughts in your head, but writing it out and making it explicit actually interferes with the process of making. Um, I had a similar experience with um, graduate school, which I did here. Um, uh, which is that graduate school 
required hunting down every footnote and every reference with a level of certainty or a completest tendency. You have to complete the whole sentence and the whole thought that I found interferes with making work, um, actually, that there's a certain um, forgetting that you need to do when you make work. So maybe maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah, there, there's a reason why after a certain point, I actually stopped writing in this vein. So the book also came out because I don't write like that anymore. Because yes, I did find that sometimes interferes uh, with making work for me. That's it question. creates a cloud. Yeah. Sorry, I'll say that. It, it Not that it interferes, but it creates a cloud in your head of too many references that you don't want always to have in the front of your um, consciousness. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose to some extent, one can also think about um, it, it, this sort of tension with language that you've also put forward i mean i don't i don't want to really stretch it too much but i think um you know one can think about how if you materialize or externalize certain things and that can inherently perhaps interfere with that process that fluidity that you need um in creating work before i go on to perhaps maybe one more question i just wanted to remind the audience that um any questions or comments that you may have please do share it in the q a box and we'll just get to it right after. I think I have maybe one more question. Um, yeah, um, I was just sort of wondering, you know, there is a kind of, you don't really have a strict timeline because of course it's not really a very straightforward mapping of practices within X, Y, Z, you know, time periods, as you said, it very much is, you know, subjective in, in a certain sense and coming out of your own but, friendships and solidarity. Right, but but I will say one thing about the timeline, even though there's not explicit timeline, the memories, things I remember, and yeah. then re bring back in such as world music, um, or raids on blue films, you know, that's, there's no video stores anymore. There's no VHS. Those are from the night, the memories are from 1980s. Yeah. And then the contemporary practices are from the 90s and 2000s. So there is that sort of. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and that is what I actually wanted to come to, wherein that a lot of practices that you talk about have a particular, um, you know, focus on the late 80s, late 80s, 1990s. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and within the larger history of the practices that you look at, it is sort of filtered through this post partitions dynamics that have emerged in the area. Um, you know, these dynamics with institution makers, practitioners and authors. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to talk about, I mean, of course, a lot of it is personal in the sense that a lot of your memories are of this particular time period, but, um, you know, wh why this became a kind of history that may need to be shared at this moment. So in, 20, in 2022, 2023, for instance, oh, sorry, 23 or 24, um, you know, how can we then look at that sort of period of the late 80s, 90s? Um, and reflect on that now. I mean, one is, of course, uh, just the way things played out, right? This is the period when I was writing a lot for the English newspapers. Um, you know, there's a point when Daily Star, I published almost every uh, three or four weeks. Um, and my editor was Zafar Soban, who then moved to the Dhaka Tribune. So he was a friend. So it was sort of like, he's like, what are you thinking about right now? And so why don't you write something with that kind of flow? So the pieces are clustered in that period when Zafar Soban was the editor of the opinions page of Daily Star. So the reviews also came out in the opinion pages where they don't belong, but it, it was just where he could publish it. So it's like a expediency of, can you write something that's 2000 words and I'm going to smuggle it into the op-ed section um, as opposed to the culture section. So there were those kinds of flows. Um, but the other thing um, that I think I feel after having completed the collating is that in the you know, 1970s, I didn't really, I was too young to remember anything, but 1980s is when I really start witnessing 80s, 90s. There's two things go, or two or three things going on. One is that the Western culture, whose hegemonic influence I talk about as having seeped into all of us and skewed us in certain ways, was also not so easy to get, right? You had to track down things. It wasn't, you know, it isn't with the facility of the Netflix Netflix queue of somebody in New York City is now the same as the Netflix queue of somebody in Dhaka. And, you know, yes, you'll get the most popular in Dhaka thing and I'll get a different one in New York. But increasingly, and this is the worrying part, the lists are the same, right? Bullet Train is the number one viewed, terrible film, by the way. Bullet Train is the number one viewed film in New York and it's the same in Dhaka. And that 
that's actually quite frightening that such disparate cities are converging and of course converging on always a western film or a, even korean film hegemony i don't necessarily think is like a break because all part of the same project but let me not go down that wormhole yet uh but in the 1980s and 90s this is also the period before the arrival of um, private television and satellite television in large quantities so you really had to look even to find western culture you know you had you had television that ran from um 4 or 6 p.m till midnight so you know, there was not media overabundance. And that's the context within which we grew up. That's the beginnings of our uh, media literacy. So there was still a chance for a local project to get as much air or even more than an international project. It wasn't, you know, today, if somebody, uh, a 15 year old decides, I just want to watch Bangla films, they would have a hard time because all around them is English. Um, English medium schools are now a phenomenon that wasn't the case when I was growing up, there were a handful of schools. So you had a um, you had a even struggle for dominance, right? And um, Bengali, Bangladeshi elements, culture, films, books had actually dominated, right? Um, Western culture was actually not the dominant force. That's all gone now, right? There's a almost like a Pax Americana of um, a certain kind of globalized Euro-American culture that dominates and. I'm saying this as somebody who also writes in English, so I'm part of the contradiction. Um, and as a result of that, perhaps also, the aesthetic of um, the look and feel and obsessions of Bangladeshi film, literature, visual practices were of a very particular type. And one of the things that for more recent things in the last 10, 15 years is the work is now at a beautiful aestheticized level where it's at a I don't want to use the word global standard, but a global legibility. So Bangladeshi films will go to Cannes and go up for the Oscars and you know, sign deals with Net. There's a Bangladeshi filmmaker who signed a deal with an American um, talent agency. And so there'll probably be a Hollywood release of some kind. It's extremely polished. The production of these films, I've just written an essay for Bioscope Journal where I talk about how, the, how you can now make a film about 1971 and recreate a train going down the track, this was in the film Guerrilla, which is also already quite a few years old, and it looks like 1971. Whereas when we grew up, restagings of history would always look extremely archaic um, and not actually match the time. So there is a professionalization and um, a smooth finish to the films, but I find it all looks the same to me, right? I, I watch... Okay, I shouldn't say quite this, and I, I want to be careful not to go too far with this argument. But there is a, uh, there starts to be a familiarity where yes, the things that were made in the eighties and nineties, um, I just felt were had a unique language and a bizarreness and a quirkiness. The labels in exhibitions were just, you know, a uh, uh, peculiar kind of language that we'd invented. And now all the wall labels in a gallery look like a wall label in a gallery anywhere, right? And that's a certain kind of, um, you know, I don't want to get into this whole like nostalgia for the past that because the past was better because we had one channel television. Most people would say, what are you talking about? That was six hours of state controlled television. And that's how military governments could stay for so long because they control the news. Right? I mean, I actually, I should talk about that. I grew up in the time when the news was under a military government. That's my eighties. Uh, there was a military government for the last decade of that period. And television news was just, nobody watched it because it was a state control. So, when I get nostalgic, uh, <laughs> someone should stop me and say, but don't forget that there was this as well. Now it's much harder to control the flows. Um, and maybe for many filmmakers, um, going into that international circuit is a escape from certain suffocating forces at home as well. So all of that is there. Um, I, I feel that as I'm speaking through this, I'm sketching a cloud of feelings about this that is contradictory because my feelings are about it are contradictory um, as well. And I'm, uh, I, I live in the past mostly, but I have a, have a worry about nostalgia as well. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll pause there. I will, I will say that this is not a complete sentence. It's a muddling yeah. around. Which I think explains a lot about just this whole sort of reflection that a lot of us, I think, face, especially with the 80s and the 90s, 
in our particular moment. So um, we had one question uh, from the audience. Uh, Ohna has asked, when you are working or writing a piece, do you keep a specific group of audience or readers in mind while doing so? The pieces have all usually come about because of a argument or adda that I'm having with peers. And at some point, the, ar the argument reaches the point where to resolve it, I have to write about it. So Abir Shom, Mullah Shagor, uh, Joy De Broaja, uh, Rajiv Dotto, I'm mentioning four artists that are written about, all came about because after the show we were arguing. And, you know, I said something about, you know, with Abir is like people aren't getting it. They think this is a background for a selfie with Mullah Shagor, the, you know, the, the sort of trying to, trying to make things make sense for us after viewing the work and thinking, but what am I going to do? Stand outside the exhibition and explain this to everybody that's coming. So it um, came out of that. There were some pieces that have come from a larger um, uh, struggle over meaning, including one piece that's actually not in this book because it's really long. Um, it would have been the entire book, um, which actually was the reason I went to graduate school. And maybe I'll talk about it as a way to answer Ohona's question. Um, so there was a book called uh, Dead Reckoning, uh, Memories of the 1971 War, a book written by Surmila Bose, um, um, whose brother is, of course, the academic um, uh, and uh, also politically involved, Shogoto Bose. Um, and Surmila Bose is, of course, from Shubhash Chandra Bose's family. I'm just contextualizing that to say why Bangladeshis were so shocked that when someone from that family wrote this book, but also we shouldn't expect that Subhash Bose's um, family member would automatically write a Bangladeshi history that would be what we wanted. And what we wanted is also problematic. Anyway, Dead Reckoning is, a his is an alternative history of 1971, whose argument essentially is that the Bangladeshi narrative of the war is highly exaggerated. Most of our narratives of uh, violence and suffering are inflated. Um, she challenged the death toll that other people have also challenged, but she did it in a quite dramatic way where she said instead of 3 million, it might be less than 100,000. And that's also actually a uh, uh, reference, I think, even though she doesn't credit it, to a footnote in Sisson and Rose's History of 1971, where there's a footnote buried that people hadn't noticed in all these years, where an Indian um, government official is interviewed and he says, oh yeah, we exaggerated the numbers because we're trying to get uh, the world attention. And this official says, oh, maybe the number was you know, less than 100,000. So that, uh, that, de that debate then spills into it, my point is that it was in a footnote before, so nobody noticed it. But in Sir Bose's book, it becomes a central um, argument. So the book's very controversial, of course, the Bangladeshi ecosphere. This is kind of when the dawn of social media explodes. And I was on this email thread with, I would say, what you could consider a nexus of academic activists from Bangladesh, you know, smaller group of us who are my generation, a bigger group or older generation, including Afsan Choudhury, the historian of uh, about whom I've also made a film. And there was this thing that troubled me, and maybe Ahana, this gets to, you know, what's the audience, which is that everybody dismissed the book, but also people said, oh, but I haven't read it. And there was one person who said, I'm not going to give her money, right? As if getting a pirated copy in Bangladesh would get Surmila Bose money, or as if depriving her of that. I just thought there was, that it, it really troubled me, the idea that I'm not going to buy this book because the book is so disgusting right and I, I found the problematic anyway and and so everybody was sort of like we already know what the 1971 war is and if somebody challenges it call us we don't need to know anything more and I just sort of sat there and I was waiting for the elders I really was thinking that way the elders the seniors the um you know bhais and appas are going to write you know I'm going to just be the young person that maybe carries the water for the piece, maybe gets it published. And I just waited and waited for the um, bhais and appas to write. And, you know, this went on for a month and a half. And finally, out of this sort of, you know, so maybe that's also the impetus of, you know, we're talking about it, but we're not actually talking about it. I finally wrote this piece and it ended up being this, why it's not in the book is because it was a 10,000 word piece with 70 footnotes, because I was also going into this war of facts, right? I don't feel that way anymore. That piece was written in 2011. I feel that that war of facts that I was in was also problematic in some ways. But the audience there, I think very specifically was all these Bangladeshi academics and historians who 
felt that we don't even need to bother engaging with a book that has a critical view because we already know our truth. Um, and, you know, of course, we don't actually know our truth. Um, not everything in Sarmila Bose's book was incorrect. It was more her editorializing that was deeply problematic. And so maybe sometimes the audience is uh, peers because you're having a conversation and somehow it stopped. And I'm not necessarily very skilled at being at a adda and dominating the adda. If it's with elders, I'm usually the quieter one. So sometimes I go home and think, oh, I should have said this. I should have said that. Why didn't I make that point? So the piece becomes a way to do that as well. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, I think I'll just end with maybe one tiny question which you may not have an answer for. Um, but I was just wondering, you mentioned how a lot of the, in, the anthology is mostly short form or like slightly expanded versions of essays that have come out in the past. Um, and I was just wondering, perhaps this is just curiosity, what you ma how are you envisioning some of your longer pieces? Um, is there another anthology in the making or, or is it is, is there a different form that you're thinking about for them? Right. Uh, there could be an anthology um, actually of pieces specifically on the 1971 war as represented in um, cinema and literature. So I mentioned the Sormi Bose book. That was my first major work on 97 and it became the inspiration for why I went to graduate school because I thought I need to learn how to write and I need to debate these academics who are writing Bangladeshi history. I don't feel the task of academia is necessarily that kind of debating, you know. Um, so there's that piece, there's a, a long piece about the surrender photograph, uh, surrender ceremony and how Indian and Pakistani officers are there and there are no Bangladeshi officers except one uh, that's called... Uh, the Ginger Merchant of History. That's that's a long piece that's come out and needs to be an anthology. There's a piece that I just mentioned in Bioscope that compares two films, one made in 72 and one made in uh, 2012, I think, um, which is still in editing phase. So on the 71 war on film and in literature, I feel there could be an anthology of three or four pieces. I think that would be, I would love to put that together. Um, I would have to find a publisher um, that I, you know, would want to work with on such a long form. I think that one would be more complicated because in some ways these pieces, um, there are hints of a uh, alternative history. Uh, for example, in the reference to um, uh, Tasliman Nasreen, there's a question about an alternative, uh, different feminist history that Tasliman Nasreen's exile to first Sweden and then India has ruptured, right? And she hasn't been back to Bangladesh since her exile. So that's almost a, 20 plus year of exile. So there's a reference to what kind of feminist history would have happened if she hadn't left, if Lodja hadn't been embraced by um, actually a Indian right-wing government and political force that thought the question of communal riots in Bangladesh would benefit a certain political equation in India. So there are references to that in the Tosi Manasreen piece. There are references to uh, other histories of diaspora um, living in both the review of Zia Haider Rahman um, and another one, um, you know, Babu Bangladesh, which is a book that's published posthumously. I talk about other left histories. So I think the 71 anthology, if that um, ever comes out, would, would be more uncomfortable for people because also over time, my views on the war have changed or my views of representations of the war. And it increasingly is a divergence with what, um, what is, I don't want to say mainstream, I want to say the supported version, the version of the war narrative that is funded, that is celebrated. Um, those of us um, who want to question the cracks and the blind spots of our formation, first, our earlier formation as East Bengal, then East Pakistan, then Bangladesh, you know, where we want to say things are not a smooth trajectory, getting you to nation state Bangladesh, very complicated, um, you know, we don't have time for that here, but, you know, the 1971 war is an unplanned war. And so when you have an unplanned war, you know, all sorts of things, contradictions stay unresolved during the war and then they break out afterwards, the space of the left within that, their role, how they were um, tied up in, you know, pro Peking, pro Moscow, and pro Dhaka alignments. Uh, all of that is a quite messy history, and that would be in that anthology, I think. Right. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating and another form 
um another engagement altogether i think Um, yeah, we didn't I, we didn't talk about the two Bengals. Yeah, we didn't get into that. Yeah, I'll just say the two Bengals thing partially came about because my gallery is in India in Kolkata, uh, experimenter, and because of that, I've had a long working uh, relationship with Kolkata, going there all the time, having a re- reason to be there that's beyond a visit. Um, and my last fiction film was shot in um, Kolkata, um, so there was that deep and meshing but there was also the awareness that partition has done something very specific to the two bengals and there are ways that they can come back together in these utopian cross border projects but then there are ways that they also are actually quite far apart in some fundamental ways that have developed since partition right so one of the arguments is oh we were not so far apart neighbor was we got along with our neighbors why was partition necessary that's very true but after separation the neighbors have diverged in all sorts of ways that i talked about in that piece right um we have one more question but i i understand that we're quite close to time so yeah, i can know, answer it yeah, yeah i mean we can go with the response and of course if there's any future elucidation needed that can also happen mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. um so mm-hmm. the question is by tanvi who has asked um a lot of the critiques that you speak of of western institutions emerges while many of us participate in those very spaces do you see this also as a function of necessity similar to the necessity that gave rise to the environment of shifting of fluid roles of artists curators and critics in the region uh, do you feel that necessity to be somewhat reductive today or is it still largely prevalent keeping many of us engaged in these institutions while having a critique of them given their history and genesis etc sure thanks tanvi for that question and earlier i had reference to the a photography biennial that we were all in that got cancelled uh, the one curated by the three bangladeshi curators and tanvi and i were in heavy conversation around a response to that as artists so i think at that time we were also having emails about these institutions um um you know fundamentally i want to engage with uh, any institution of course within reason um that wants to host a conversation around my work and it has sometimes i think been more western institutions because of funding structures and tanvi's already referenced that in the question you may um in a certain year uh, be in two european exhibitions because both of them had the funding to stage it and to show the work in the way it's supposed to be whereas you really really want to show in nepal but that means a self organized uh, project and you know tanzim and i have talked about it that almost every project we ever done in bangladesh is self organized self funded um we are we are our own tech support and that's all fine there's actually a pleasure in figuring out how to make a three channel film work having the projector synchronize um you know whether in dhaka or in uh well when i've done it in bombay it's been camp that has figured out the tech but there is a high level of we do it ourselves and you know there's tremendous pleasure in doing it yourself rather than the institution having a army of people but there is a question of um more things get done when there's funding and therefore automatically a western institutions hosting of your work uh will will dominate how much your work is shown but there's a flip side also which isn't to do with funding and i reference this to tanvi uh, in our conversation which is that uh, and again i talked about this in the book sometimes that when you are showing in the western institution or when you have the affirmation of the western institution that matters more to our local audience you know so the local audience will be the dhaka audience let's say the media the newspapers will respond in a way to a film being selected for khan in a way they don't when the film is selected for rajshahi you know so somebody was mentioning something i said okay we're all talking about this photography biennial in germany but i was in jogja photography biennial in indonesia that went off well no hitch they showed the work it engaged with an indonesian audience and in bangladesh there was no Indonesia okay let's talk about why that worked there was just a, the the loss of the german biennial is a major loss the actual existence of the indonesian biennial doesn't have an impact so i face this my whole life that um projects in pakistan india nepal sri lanka um just to stay with south asia don't have the same traction in um in the local audience's mind so if if there's something that i you know where i want to take tanvi's question and also tanvi's provocation it's that 
you know, we need to work really hard and extensively on how to make our makers and audiences, how to interest them uh, that when something is being shown in the South Asian context, that should be starting the discourse. It, you know, I, I said about this challenge of writing in English, but it isn't just about writing in English. It's about the fact that a, uh, a, a German photography biennial, if it had happened, if it hadn't been canceled, I would have had people coming and saying that film that you showed at uh, Mannheim, uh, how can we get a copy? Even though that film has shown multiple times in Dhaka at multiple venues, including Patshala, the venue where Shoydul Alam Tanzim Wahab and Munem Wasif have all taught, and uh, Tanzim and Wasif are both trained there, and it has shown extensively in India, but somehow it didn't register, right? Or there's a sort of like, I've had this happen, and, I'm, and I don't want to get on a uh, soapbox about it, but there is that, uh, you know, the problem of uh, differential values and Western institutions dominating discourse um, and pulling in our labor and time isn't just that they have the capital and they come calling. It's that those are the things our audiences and peers respond to, and they don't respond in the same way with the local situations. So I'm committed to trying to build up the local situation, which is also why this book, it's published in Bangladesh, distributed in Bangladesh. It's, it's, it makes it tremendously complicated, actually. It's hard to get the book. It takes a while. Shipping anything from Bangladesh actually means going through. If anyone orders it from India, you may get it directly from the Indian local distributor at this point. But if copies run out, then you'll get it from Bangladesh and you'll see this, you know, there'll be a national ID card photocopied on the back, which is like a customs clearance. You know, these are all things that slow things down. And uh, I think as far as I know, my publisher said he can't actually ship to Pakistan because of whatever regulations are going on right now regarding government shipping. That may have changed. You know, there are ways that our governments and our institutions also make even a South-South, South Asia-South Asia, South Asia uh, dialogue difficult. You know, any Indian, Bangladeshi or Pakistani artist will tell you that, you know, one of the reasons that we often end up in Dubai for an exhibition is because that's the place where everybody can get a visa or Nepal, you know, or Sri Lanka, but many of us can't, or many Pakistani artists can't arrive to a show in India. So our, our nation states and our institutions are also making it quite hard for us to have these things. And I think it's our task to figure out how to go against that and have more of that um, South, South heavy collaboration. I think I'll just say Tanvi and I and others, even through our ex experience of this, uh, photography biennial in Germany came out saying, well, we just need to figure out how to build our local structures so that we have our own autonomous situations that keep going without needing this. And then if it still comes, let it come. We can go, we work there as equals, not a, you know, helping hand, but just as um, equal artists with others. But the local institutions need to be developed more. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there because I can go on and on, but I'm being circular maybe a little bit. No, and I mean, I think um, just in the interest of time, but also at the point that we have ended, I think it just, it's just such a generative space, right, where you contend with these complexities of the past while also striving to build something for the future, always. I think that's just um, a lovely sentiment to end this with. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you, Naeem, for... Um, you know, giving us so much time and taking us through the book, but also in in, in the larger conversations that emerged here. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the audience for sticking around. Um, before we end, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, a limited run of the book right now is available at the Offset Bookshop. Um, and I believe there's another link where you can also order directly from the publisher. So whichever, you know, if you are not based in India, I believe the second link would be easier to access. Oh. Yeah, but yeah, for any Indian, I think Indian um, people who might want to order the book, it's up at Offset. Yeah, thank you again, Naim, and thank you to the audience for attending the talk. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening slash rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>